And the Trump administration standing united in its maximum pressure campaign against North Korea as the nation's dictator Kim Jong-un reportedly pledges to shut down his main underground nuclear testing site in May in exchange for a truce. The White House demanding action before making any concessions. This is Outnumbered, and I'm Melissa Francis here today. Town Hall editor and Fox News contributor Kitty Pavlage, host of Kennedy on the Fox Business Network, Kennedy, anchor of the Intelligence Report, also on FBN, Trish Regan, and joining us on the couch today, Republican Senator from South Carolina, Lindsey Graham. He is wildly outnumbered, Senator. Sure too. <laughs> Thank you for coming back. Thanks for joining us today. No shortage yeah. of topics, right? No shortage. Are you going to be giving out your phone number on this or uh, no, never again? Hopefully not. No, okay. <laughs> All right. Potentially historic developments on the Korean Peninsula. South Korean officials announcing North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un has agreed to terminate his nuclear weapons program if the United States vows to formally end the North Korean war and pledges not to invade his country. He reportedly also said he will invite experts and journalists from the United States to the North to ensure transparency on the issue. National Security Advisor John Bolton touting the latest developments, but indicating that he needs to see not just words, but action out of Pyongyang. There's nobody starry-eyed around here, and we've all been called a number of things. Naive is not usually one of them. I think the president sees the potential here for a historic agreement, uh, a breakthrough that nobody could have imagined uh, even a few months ago. That potential is there. Uh, but as he says repeatedly, uh, the potential for no deal at all is also there. And, and we're not going to know uh, until we actually have the meeting and see what Kim Jong-un is prepared to do. It's certainly the case that mere words aren't going to sway anybody. Senator, your thoughts? Well, uh, we got a chance that I never saw coming. Uh, why now, Trump? Uh, why is China signing on to sanctions they never signed on to before, Trump? Why is North Korea thinking I better do something different? Trump, he's made it real to North Korea that if he had to, he would use military force, President Trump would, to stop their ability to hit America with a nuclear tip missile coming from North Korea. I don't think they believe that about anybody else. Yeah. Long story short, North Korea believed the way to survive as a regime was to get a capability to hit America that would stand us down, we would leave him alone, we'd try to contain the threat. The problem is he'll sell anything he builds. And along come Trump, Trump and he says denial. I'm never going to give you the ability to hit my homeland with a nuclear weapon if you keep trying. That's the end of you and your regime. So they've changed strategy because of Trump. Can I ask you a question though? You, when you were running for president, obviously foreign policy was a big yeah. issue, and and, this and is obviously something... nobody listened to what I had to say. Well, how how would you have done <laughs> things differently <laughs> as, as president though? And would you do you think you would have come to this conclusion with the Lindsey Graham administration? I told the North Korean, uh, I mean, excuse me, the Chinese ambassador, if you don't think Trump's crazy, you're crazy. Crazy like a fox. I think he made a decision early on. Let me tell you my first meeting with President Trump after he got elected. He asked me, uh, I don't have your phone number. And I said, there's a reason for that. Right. So, <laughs> we so, all remember. Yeah, right. But I gave him my new phone number. So far, so good. Uh, the bottom line, he asked a question early on with McMaster. We're having lunch. He said, what's my biggest challenge? I said, North Korea in the short term, Iran in the long term. You got to make a decision. Do you give them the capability to hit America, tell them if they ever use it, you're going to wipe them off the map? That's called containment. Or do you do a policy of denial? You never allow them the capability to hit our country with a nuclear tipped missile. And he asked me what I'd do. I said, I'd go denial because everything they built in the past, they've sold. And I think the president made the decision early on that he's never going to let North Korea hit America with a nuclear tipped missile. And he'd go to war to stop it if he had to. And they believe him. The difference is nobody believed Obama. Yeah. And yeah. every president before, nobody believed. But they believed Trump. I don't think I could have done. Maybe they think I'm crazy. But the bottom <laughs> line is Trump has convinced China that North Korea is more of a problem for them than an asset. And that's what's changed. Well, You're not the only one to give him credit. Hang on one second. I'll let you. Um, Ambassador Bolton said something sort of similar. Let's listen. I think that the maximum pressure campaign that the Trump administration has put on North Korea has, uh, along with the uh, political military pressure, has brought us to this point. I mentioned President Moon before this just this past week, President Macron of France, Chancellor Merkel of Germany, uh, Prime Minister Abe of Japan, the week before that, this morning, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull of Australia, have all acknowledged we are at this point because of American pressure. 
And it's interesting, too, to watch how the administration, whether it's North Korea or whether it's Europe and NATO and going into Syria, have been able to kind of rally the allies to a common cause in the situation. Mm -hmm. Senator Graham brings up a very good point when he talks about the North Koreans selling uh, you know, nuclear weapons or nuclear materials to other countries. Right. We've seen that, I believe, in Pakistan. They've gotten a lot yeah. of their nuclear program from Syria. North Korea. So the interest is bigger than just North Korea. But I have questions about what the end game here is in North Korea. I, I would want to know from you, what do they want outside of just the things that they're saying about not invading us? Because what that really means is we want uh, less U.S. military right. uh, power on the peninsula. And that's something that the United States has said that we're not going to do. Okay, so, we, we just want to show you, if we can pause for one second. This is the president of Nigeria, Nigerian President Buhari, arriving here. Um, there is going to be a joint presser later on today, but they are supposed to talk about economic and security issues, namely Boko Haram um, and the challenge that that has been in Nigeria and um, as well as some of the, um, you know, weapons and also aircraft that have been sold recently to Nigeria in order to help with this insurgent. So there's a lot of security issues and economic issues to talk about here. And we're watching him go inside now and we can go back to the discussion. Go ahead. Well, Nigeria is the most important player in Africa. Radical Islam is moving to Africa. We've got to get ahead of it. We've got nation states like Iran, North Korea, Russia and China. So what's unique about North Korea? It's run by one man and one family. Yeah. So if you can convince him that his days are numbered, he will change. He could care less what you do to his people. Putin's Russia is about Putin. Uh, uh, the Ayatollah runs Iran. It's about him and his cronies. Unlike America, where it's about an idea, not one person, we can convince <laughs> even, even him. Now? Huh? <laughs> even now? Even now. Even now. If we can convince Kim Jong-un that his regime is more at risk by threatening America, then he will stop. How does this end? A peace treaty to replace an armistice, a promise we're not going to invade, and a complete give up of the nuclear program uh, and do away with sanctions over time is how this ends. But it's it's okay, but here's, okay, here's the question now because for a second. Yeah, I, I just wanna, thank you, Melissa. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned the military being sort of the driving force in the terms of, of the threat of it. What about the economic sanctions, however? Very because important. I think, you know, as you pointed out when you started, the president has been able to bring China to the table so we can discuss this tariff issue in a much more meaningful way. Um, they've gotten sanctions against North Korea uh, from China, from Russia. How much of that, I mean, before we jump to the military option, has played in the decision I process? I can't think of a time where sanctions have taken a brutal, ruthless dictator and alone changed their behavior. He runs gulags on the scale of World War II. Yeah. He has mass rapes of women. He killed, he killed his you know, uncle with an anti-aircraft gun. So remember who you're talking about. So I think economic pressure matters, but he can always live well, and he could give a damn about how other people live. Mm -hmm. There's only so much you can get out of economic sanctions, but they've been applied in a way never before, mm -hmm. and they've hurt. China does 90% of the trade with North Korea. They begin to turn off the spigot. But what's changed his attitude is that he believes if he had to, Donald Trump would take him out. That's that's absolutely true. And, and it just goes to show when, you know, Kim Jong Un through President Moon talks about denuclearizing, right. you know, he's very specific in saying the United States has to sign a treaty saying that the Korean War is over and they have to promise not to attack the North. So it's that implicit fear of military aggression from it. the United States. But I think that coupled with the sanctions and, you know, North Korea has always done the same thing. They've they've always with a very silver tongue yeah. gone to the United States yeah. and said, we promise we're dismantling this. You can come in and see. And then at the last minute, and they did this between the Bush administration and the Obama administration. Within a year, they said they were giving all of it up. And then in 2009, launched, uh, launched another nuclear missile test. So, so what's different? Yes. Trump said that they played everybody like a fiddle. They're not going to play me. And here's the calculation North Korea has to make. What is the risk of meeting with Donald Trump and playing him like a fiddle? I think you're a nut if you do that. The best thing they could do is not meet with Trump if they intend to play him down the road. Mm. Because if they do that, we're going to have a war and North Korea is going to lose it. A lot of people are going to die. It would be a terrible to have a war with North Korea. But Donald Trump's not going to be played. And I'm telling you right now, North Korea is playing with fire. Because if they do that, they're going to get fury. So we're either going to have peace 
or we're going to have war. There is no in between. Mm. All right. President Trump calling out a sitting Democratic senator whom he accuses of unfairly taking down his pick for Veterans Affairs Secretary Ronnie Jackson. Why the president says Montana Senator John Tester should not be reelected and why some are now advising the president not to go too far. Plus, Vice President Mike Pence set to depart Washington, heading for the U.S.-Mexico border. This as hundreds of migrants await their chance to apply for asylum inside the United States. The ongoing showdown and why border experts say this time it's different. Under the Obama administration, we just let anybody and everybody, everybody that came to the ports of entry, we would take them. But this time the president has said no. President Mike Pence set to depart Washington for the U.S.-Mexico border as there is an ongoing situation there with hundreds of migrants arriving at the border saying they are seeking asylum. The vice president is going to get a firsthand look at, at construction of the border wall. And not too far away, a caravan of Central American migrants are waiting to submit their asylum claims. Yesterday, some can be seen scaling but not going over a border fence, <clears throat> big teases. Also yesterday, the Border <laughs> Patrol informed the caravan that the facility near San Diego did not have enough space to accommodate them at this time. And here is how an attorney for the migrants responded. The message for Customs and Border Protection, stop rejecting asylum seekers who try to present themselves at the port of entry. You know what you're doing. You know you turn people away. You complain that they are breaking the law entering illegally, you are breaking the law and you are forcing them to break the law. That's why we have caravans. So much law breaking. Meantime, Texas Attorney General says such a large group arriving at the same time can make processing difficult. It does make it difficult as these large numbers of people, when they come in at the same time, it makes it challenging for us to process them um, appropriately. Ultimately, I think they will get their hearing. I mean, uh, they have a right to an asylum hearing. However, it'll be, it'll be a legitimate hearing, and these people will have to show, as I said, they'll have to show that they satisfy the conditions for asylum. All right, Senator Graham, uh, sometimes there is strength in numbers, and, you know, perhaps it makes crossing treacherous countries and Kenyans uh, a little bit safer, but at the yeah. same time, it can put so much pressure on yeah. some of those border facilities that they can do more harm than good. What should the president and the administration do here? Well, it's all around a sad story, but clearly we need to build a better wall because they can climb this one. So the three triangle countries, Guatemala, um, uh, Nicaragua and El Salvador are really bad spots right now. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to invest in making their countries better so they can stay here. But our laws are stupid. Trump's right about this. If you come to Canada on the border mm -hmm. and you ask for asylum, they don't bring in the country and put you in a detention facility. You stay on the Canadian side of the border and we process your claim. What we have to do is harmonize our laws. We have an asylum program, but it's got a hole in it. If you can get to the border, and make a claim that you're being oppressed, once you step foot in the country, you can stay and eventually we release you. That is a magnet for more illegal immigration. It abuses the asylum process. We should have an asylum, asylum application program in the country where they live, not on our border. Wait, yeah. but, but what, you know, they'll say that they're under threat of harm during that period and that it takes too long and you could die in the meantime. I mean, is there a humanitarian way to deal with it? When they're staying on the Canadian border, where, where are they going in the meantime? Well, Hockey all games? I can, they're staying in Canada. Yeah. All I can tell you is that come to the Congo with me. And if you want to see people in a bad spot, the world is full of people in bad spots. We can't take everybody in our country who's had a bad hand dealt. I'm willing to invest in the root cause of it, improving the economies of Central America. As Mexico stabilizes, you're getting less Mexican illegal immigrants. Now it's moving down to Central America. But the magnet of asylum is creating this problem. It's terrible to watch, but Trump is right to say, we're gonna change our laws. We don't wanna entice mothers to take that thousand mile walk mm -hmm. because if they think they can get here, they're home free. We wanna let them know that doesn't work so, anymore yeah. and try to help them where they live. So what are you talking about doing then in a place like Honduras? Okay, three things. We put $750 million for the triangle countries to deal with their energy. They don't have affordable energy. Corruption is rampant. 
and no jobs. How do you make sure that that money, money doesn't that? go to drug cartels, though? We have any money for that? Aren't we twenty-one uh, trillion dollars in debt yeah, to not, be in, yeah. investing right. in other countries that can't seem to get their own right. economies together? The entire foreign aid budget is one percent of the entire budget. It's fifty-four billion dollars, which is one percent of all federal spending. You either going to deal with the problem down there or deal with them when they get to the border. Uh, in terms of what drives the debt, it's Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid make up almost 75 percent of the debt. You could eliminate the Department of Defense and not even move the debt needle. So $750 billion invested in a better economy would make it less likely they need to leave their country. So do two things at once. Help them where they live and secure your border and change your laws to stop them from believing that they got to America, they're home free. All right. Well, moving on. Meantime, the president at a rally in Michigan over the weekend threatening a government shutdown this fall if Congress does not provide more funding to build his border wall. We have to have borders and we have to have them fast and we need security. We need the wall. We're going to have it all. And again, that wall has started. We got one point six billion. We come up again on September 28th, and if we don't get border security, we'll have no choice. We'll close down the country because we need border security. But Republican Congressman Peter King warns that a shutdown over the wall could backfire, especially with the critical midterms coming up this fall. I don't believe we should shut the government down. It's never worked in the past. And with elections coming up a month after that, that would enable the Democrats to win. And the first thing they will do is move to impeach President Trump. Uh, Kennedy, the president felt like the ominous bill that he got was misleading and that he didn't get everything he wanted when it comes to border security. It's pretty far out to be talking about a government shutdown in September, but maybe it's a negotiating tactic to get them working on it now. Yeah, we are uh, pretty far out from from September. But, you know, it, it's not a surprise that this is something that the president is so passionate about. But I think he has to be very, very careful about the timing because people still, you know, th there is optimism, but some of those economic optimism numbers are eroding a little bit and people still think the economy is doing good not as many of them think the economy is doing great mm -hmm. so republicans are much better served if they focus on the economy creating jobs allowing small businesses to borrow money so they can either start or expand and that's how you have optimism become reality for those critical voters who are still very much on the fence between republicans but trish when it comes to government shutdowns you know there are mixed views on what that actually means and how it affects the everyday person outside of Washington, D.C. It's always a big crisis when it happens, mm -hmm. but September is pretty dang close to yeah. the midterm elections, and that might not play so politically no, I, I get well it. I for mean, the president's You're party. right. Um, the Republicans will get blamed for it. Uh, the president will be blamed for it. Um, the government shutdowns usually uh, cause a some hostility, shall we say, amongst those uh, that are voting for those people because they say, what the heck? You I mean, my goodness, UN, you're not you're doing your diplomat. job. The government had to shut down because of you. So I do not think it plays well yeah. for Republicans. They have to be very careful about this, very cautious about it. Uh, I think he'll manage to to get the money. I, I think he will, but I, I sure hope we aren't looking at a shutdown. Senator, are you going to give the president the wall he wants? <laughs> he, we Print need that money. 25? Second time around. Oh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> so here's what I would do if I were the president. I would put on the table a deal. I want $25 billion for a wall. We're in debt, but we can afford that. We, can, we can't afford not to have a wall. But as you saw, the wall didn't stop these people from coming from the Triangle countries. The wall doesn't keep them out when you have asyl asylum laws that let them in. Right. So if you don't change your laws, the wall won't do any good. So here's what I would make do if I were the president. I want my wall money and I want to change these stupid laws that attract people to come here. And for that, I'll give you 1.8 million DREAM Act recipients a pathway to citizenship and make the Democrats say no, I don't think they can. But Melissa, quickly, you know, that being said, the president has offered Democrats a lot and they don't yeah. seem to want to be going along with any of it. No, they don't. And I also think, I actually think people have become immune to a shutdown. I think they've heard it so many times and that it doesn't, you know, cause things that are tangible to the average American. I understand people don't get paid during that and I don't want to downplay anyone's hardship. But I think the American people just sort of roll their eyes at that. Yeah. All right. Well, moving along, a new back and forth between President Trump and James Comey as the fired FBI director continues his media blitz. But the president now says Comey's not being honest about. Plus, a high-stakes decision looming for President Trump on the future of the Iran nuclear deal. Is it fixable or should it be scrapped? We'll debate. 
I think this is a terrific opportunity uh, for President Trump, who made his reputation as a builder, uh, to build on the Iran nuclear deal. The May 12 deadline is looming for President Trump to decide whether or not to stay in the controversial Iran nuclear deal. The Trump administration is working with European allies on ways to toughen rules curbing Iran's development of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. National Security Advisor John Bolton signaling there is still hope the U.S. will stay in the deal. Let me start by underlying he has made no decision on the nuclear deal, whether to stay in or get out. He's certainly said very negative things about the deal, which, uh, which imply that, uh, that these other steps wouldn't really address that concern. But look, it's possible in the discussions with our European allies that we'll be able to see some possibility there. Newly minted Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the deal needs some serious fixes before the president decides to renew. President Trump's been pretty clear. This deal is uh, very flawed. He's directed the administration to try and fix it. And uh, if we can't fix it, he's going to withdraw from the deal. Unlike the past administration, President Trump has a comprehensive Iran strategy that is designed to counter the full array of threats emanating from Tehran. We look forward to working closely with strong allies like Israel in countering these threats. Meantime, Democratic Senator Chris Coons sounding optimistic that the president is doing the right thing when it comes to dealing with Iran. The Iranian regime is a dangerous, threatening regime, and if President Trump can successfully lead an effort with our European allies uh, to rein in or to end their ballistic missile program, uh, to put uh, a, to change the outcome of the current uh, Iranian deal so that there isn't a sunset clause, I think these would po be positive things that I would support. Senator, where do you come down? I'm shocked he said that. Yeah. I'm more optimistic now than I've been that maybe we wouldn't have a unified American position. Hmm. If the Democrats will follow his lead and say the current deal is bad because the sunset clause is bad, that we should be able to inspect anywhere in Iran, including their military bases, then we'll have a united American front that will make the Europeans try harder to get a better deal. I would be willing to write a letter to the president, if Chris will write it with me, and Pompeo saying, extend the negotiations for 90 days past May 12th and see if the Europeans can get the deal that all of us say is better. Wow. I mean, I don't yeah. see... I Just made news. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Can yeah. I come back? Can I, I come back? I don't see why, why you yeah. couldn't do that, but I think Chris Coons is also very smart because, the, you know, the, the arbitrary resistance of the president doesn't really get us anywhere. These are critical issues in Iran and North Korea. We can't just have a hawkish, kill em all approach. There has to be something more nuanced, diplomatic, tough when it needs to be, right. but it, it can also be unified. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. There needs to be a unified American. Don't domain. underrate killing them all. The interest, that yeah. gives everybody's attention. <laughs> I don't know. But, James but, 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 yeah, I can't James go there with you. Says that all but, the time. But, but you're dead right. So what is wrong with this deal? After 15 years, all the inspectors go away. Iran can enrich and reprocess without limitation. That means they can get a bomb over time without cheating. The Arabs are not going to tolerate okay, I gotta, it. I got to jump in okay. because we're and you did make news and we want to make note of that. But this is President Trump meeting with the Nigerian President Buhari in the Oval Office. We understand that they spoke of terrorism, trade um, of Christians being murdered in Nigeria as well about Boko Haram. And we want to listen in right now and hear that conversation. It's an honor to be with President Buhari of Nigeria. Uh, we have many things that we do together, as you know. Uh, Probably, uh, especially on terrorism and terrorism related. Uh, we also have a very big trade deal that we're working on for military equipment, helicopters and the like. Uh, we have uh, met before. We have developed a great relationship and we look forward to our discussion today. Uh, very important, but again, especially as it relates to terrorism. And that's terrorism here and terrorism all over the world. It's a hotbed and we're going to be stopping that. Also, we've had very serious problems with Christians who have been murdered, killed in Nigeria. We're going to be working on that problem and working on that problem very, very hard because we can't allow that to happen. Mr. President, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for coming. Thank, 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 thank you. Really good. Thank you. I thank you, Mr. President, uh, very much for inviting me. It's a great honor. I'm very grateful for it. Um, certainly, security 
the main issue. We are very grateful to the United States. Okay, for we're going to dip back out of this, and we want to let you know that these two have a big press conference coming up at 1.30 where they're going to address a lot of the pertinent issues, including the one that we were just talking about, we think, Iran. And I, I want to go back to you on that because you did make some news right before this. You had some, a suggestion right. on what you would be willing to do. Yeah. And, and do you think Democrats would be receptive to that? I didn't think about this until this morning. I was on Brian's show when I heard the quote by Chris, and y'all played it. It's the first time I've seen it. <clears throat> it is a terrible deal the way it is because it ensures a nuclear arms race. If you could change the deal to say that 50 years from now we're going to have inspectors in Iran, if they ever get within a year of a breakout, we'll reimpose sanctions, that means you probably have pretty good insight and control over the nuclear program. Uh, if Democrats would be willing to support President Trump's idea of what a new deal would look like, I would argue to the president and Pompeo to give more time before you withdraw. But here's the condition. Democrats have to get behind the idea of making it a better deal. Yeah. Does that mean also making sure that there are safeguards in there so the lifted sanctions and the money that flows in doesn't go to Hezbollah? Uh, well, that ship has already sailed, but the, as, as to term of, of flow of future money, yes. So the deal would change in three ways. The missile program would be part of the deal. It's not today. Right. The sunset clause would go away. Mm -hmm. And what you can inspect military bases, which you can't now. Yeah. 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 Well, well, Iran is not at the table either, which makes the whole thing interesting. It's the Europeans and the Americans making decisions. But a new battle between President Trump and James Comey, as the former FBI director continues his media blitz. The president calling out Comey at his rally in Michigan Saturday, saying he was honest about his actions in the run-up to the Mueller probe. How about this guy Comey? <laughs> Comey's a liar and a leaker. You know, but you know, I did you a great favor when I fired this guy. I tell you, I did you a great favor. Because when you look at what was going on at the top of the FBI, it is a disgrace, and everybody in this room understands it. Comey hitting back the next day, setting President Trump trying to undermine the Russia investigation, and that special counsel Robert Mueller should not trust the president. Watch. I have serious doubts about his credibility. The president of the United States? Yes. Uh, whether he were under oath or not. Correct. How long is this feud going to go on? What about that guy, Comey? What about him? <laughs> <laughs> Did President Trump do us all a service by firing him? Uh, well, let's put it this way. I'm glad he's not there. Let's look at Comey's actions while he was there. The FBI investigation of the Clinton email scandal was a joke. The head investigator had a bias against Trump, very much for Clinton, and uh, they were talking about creating an insurance policy to make sure Trump didn't win. So the server was never given over. They beat it with a hammer and bleached it out, and nobody went to jail. She was interviewed, not under oath. To me, I think the whole investigation around Clinton was a joke. They had their thumb on the scale for her. When it comes to the dossier that was used early on to get a warrant against Carter Page, Comey said he didn't know it was paid for by the Democratic Party. Yeah. Right. That is stunning that the FBI used a dossier prepared by a foreign agent who was paid by a political party to find dirt on Trump in Russia, mm -hmm. who could easily have been manipulated by the Russian intelligence service. And to this day, he claims he didn't know it was that? a paid document by a political party. Do you believe him on that? I mean, I, how, how, do you, how do you run the well, We're journalists, him, by the way. We want to know where our information is coming from, from our sources. Right. It's a it similar type of thing. He said he wasn't concerned so about there's it. One Would you things. go with a story if you didn't know where it was so. from? No, right. Now, right. We're talking about providing a document to a court to get a warrant on an American system. You should know where the damn thing comes from. Right. Well, and the FBI also has <laughs> incredible surveillance powers of email, particularly uh, overseas, if there are any... So they could have found out if they wanted they, they, to. They absolutely could have. And, and if that was something that was so critically important to national security, it speaks to his incompetence. Or James mind. Comey has been right. talking a lot yeah. about moral superiority and competence on this media blitz of his. And if he didn't know that Peter Strzok and Lisa Page were compromised in, in one direction toward a, a Democratic presidential candidate and against another, then all, that also speaks to his emotional incompetence. Well, the fact that he 
couldn't read people and he couldn't ask basic questions mm -hmm. about the funding of a compromised document. It, it yeah. just shows can, that he was an incompetent person and he would have been fired by either administration. If I could add to that, I mean, he was asked by our Brett Baer yeah. whether or not there was any bias uh, at the FBI, specifically from Lisa and Peter. And he said no. He also I, still I don't think there's any Andrew bias. McCabe, I mean, how right? can you look at that and not see bias? He, he backed McCabe again, but my, the question now is moving yeah. forward, right? Yeah. Where are we going with this? And we've not only seen the president question Comey's credibility, we also saw Comey going after the president, but there are conflicting accounts of what exactly went on between Andrew McCabe, uh, former Attorney General Loretta Lynch. Yeah. Comey is now under criminal investigation by the Inspector General. I mean, this is not going away, the despite DOJ all the, the mudslinging that we're seeing. He, right. he yes. made the argument out of the gate that originally it was paid for by Republicans. Republicans and then or by a Republican opponent and that in the end he knew it was paid for by somebody in the opposition but he didn't know who I find those things really hard to believe but you know Senator Graham do you think anything ever comes of any of this well I should be FBI director because I figured this all out yeah. uh, Mr. Comey in case you're watching Fusion GPS was hired by the Democratic Party the Clinton campaign who was paid $168,000 he's a former MI5, MI5 agent who had a lot of contacts in Russia he went to Russia to get dirt on uh, Trump. He was probably compromised by the Russian intelligence services. He had a bias against Trump. He told Mr. Orr, the number four guy, that uh, I'm going to do everything I can to beat Trump. All right. I'm over here. Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> that was good. I'm sorry you missed it. Yes. But this is incredible. <laughs> There should be a second counsel, special counsel appointed. Mr. Huber from Utah is a nice fellow, I'm sure. But you should have a special counsel looking at the corruption of the Department of Justice about how a warrant was used with a document that's bogus and about two FBI agents. It's okay to have political we opinions. See that application? It's not okay to create an well, insurance we're still, policy. We're still waiting uh, anxiously for that. Hey, Inspector Jeff General Sessions report. appointed second counsel. Yeah, we're, we're waiting anxiously for that Inspector General report that will. Uh, show how the yeah. FBI handled the Clinton email investigation. There's more coming, too. Until then, the gloves are off on a number of, of levels as President Trump slams Democratic Senator John Tester over scuttling Dr. Ronnie Jackson's VA secretary nomination. <laughs> the president even suggesting he has dirt on the Montana Democrat. But now at least one Republican is warning of the political risks of this fight. Up ahead. Tester started throwing out things that he's heard. Well, I know things about Tester that I could say too. And if I said him, he'd never be elected again. President Trump slamming the ranking Democrat on the Senate Veterans Affair Committee, John Tester. This after the Montana senator released a list of allegations against former nominee for VA Secretary Dr. Ronnie Jackson. The president suggesting at his rally in Michigan that he's got some dirt on the senator. Watch this. We had a very interesting thing happen over the last few days. Senator John Tester of a really great place, Montana. What they said about this great American doctor Ronnie Jackson. Tester started throwing out things that he's heard. Well, I know things about Tester that I could say too. And if I said him, he'd never be elected again. Hmm. <laughs> well, well, there's hmm. a threat. Senator Tester saying in a statement, it's my duty to make sure Montana veterans get what they need and have earned and I'll never stop fighting for them as their senator. Former Bush senior White House advisor Carl Rowe says the president's response could actually backfire. Everybody has a reason to be upset with Senator Tester. This is the kind of the worst kind of politics, the kind of stuff that goes on in Washington that makes people sick. Having said that, the president better not respond in kind. He could he could turn this from a situation where Tester's opponent can make this an issue of fairness and equity and whether and and what and what ought to go on in Washington. But if the president makes charges like he did and said, I know things and I'm going to say these things unless they're true, he could just give uh, a tester a way to, to wiggle out of this. Sounds like uh, Mr. Rove does not want a tit-for-tat situation, Senator. Um, but 
Isn't this really what is so bad about politics right now? I mean, you're in the political arena. You've had to deal with things. It, it, it seems as though they can make these wild accusations and suddenly destroy someone's career over it. So I was going to introduce Admiral Jackson to the VA committee. I've known him for a long time. He is a combat surgeon. He's an American hero. Very, very good man. Uh, I don't think the president helps himself by making idle threats uh, to the senator from Montana. I don't think he should say, I hope, you know, we take the conversations of Comey. Stuff like that hurts the president more than it helps. But here's my problem with what Tester did. He had a bunch of allegations and he gave them to the press. Yeah. And Admiral Jackson had no chance to defend himself. Now, let me tell you about the car wreck. That's a bunch of BS. Yeah, it is. Oh. So the bottom line is Admiral Jackson has been hurt unfairly. The allegations should have been vetted inside the committee. He should have been allowed to respond, but Texter, Tester runs to the press, but the president's not helping himself by playing this silly yeah. game. Right, and then, of course, you've got a press that's so anxious yeah. to, to yeah. get anything they totally. can on this administration that they're also not checking out the allegations. I think we should take a step back here and, and go back over what happened here. These allegations that Dr. Jackson allegedly was drunk on the job, giving out pills, um, were, were reported on anonymous sourcing across the media last week. Then, two days later, the Secret Service comes out with four paragraphs saying, we have no incidents uh, uh, involving Dr. Jackson. He was accused by CNN of going on a colleague's door overseas and drunkenly banging down the door and the Secret Service allegedly intervened to stop him because they were worried about waking up President Obama. Secret Service denied that there was any incident of that happening. Mm -hmm. Happening. Then they went on for two paragraphs to talk about what an outstanding professional Dr. Jackson is and talked about how he is essential to their mission in keeping the president safe. On the car accidents issue, the Associated Press went through these records after these allegations had been reported mm -hmm. and they found that there there were three incidents, minor incidents, meaning a mirror getting ripped off on a government vehicle, no alcohol involved, after the doctor so, was so accused of driving So do you think it was a malicious drunk. attack? Melissa, I mean, was this a it, deliberate It absolutely attack? seems like it was, but the problem is, is that we can't become a society where you can just say anything about right. anyone and it gets exactly. smeared everywhere, yeah. and we don't ever check these things out or bother to vet them beforehand, no, you can because when you're doing life. a background check on somebody, you, could, you go to other people, they can say anything they want. I mean, you could have an ex-spouse, somebody who's a neighbor who's mad at you who could say anything they want and if it's then smeared everywhere before it's checked Ronnie out. Ronnie Jackson is the new Ken Bone and it's not fair and I don't understand the end game. I don't understand what Democrats on the committee were trying to accomplish. All right. Well, lots of eyes right now on West Virginia, a state that the president won pretty handily. So why the GOP may be breathing a little bit easier about next week's primary and who may run against Democratic Senator Joe Manchin. We're going to discuss all of that. We'll see you here right after this. Welcome back. A big Republican primary coming up in just a few weeks in West Virginia. It could give Republicans a good idea of where they stand in the midterms. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin's seat has been a top target for the GOP since President Trump won the state with almost 69 percent of the vote. It's a three man primary field. These are the candidates. Congressman Evan Jenkins, West Virginia Attorney General Patrick Morrissey and former businessman Don Blankenship. Uh, so Obviously, Republicans don't want to have another Roy Moore situation in a popular Trump state. Don Blankenship has uh, spent a little time behind bars, <laughs> and he, he could be problematic, but he has fallen to third. Are Republicans breathing a sigh of relief, and is there a chance that that West Virginia seat will flip to red? Well, if you can't answer the following question easily, you shouldn't probably be running for the Senate. Have you been in federal prison recently? <laughs> so... <laughs> Unfortunately, the answer is too for, easy. For people dying. Yeah. So uh, clearly, if he wins the primary, it, it's a contest. Don't underestimate Manchin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a good guy. He's a good politician. But Trump won the state big. It should be a state we do well. And the only way we, would, I think, could lose is nominate somebody who's been in jail recently. So that means I'm, Evan Jenkins I'm, or Patrick Morrissey. I'm very curious about the kinds of voters in West Virginia who would go for a Republican over Joe Manchin. Because Joe Manchin is more of a blue-collar Democrat. Are Democrats who voted for Trump necessarily going to switch their vote away from Manchin to a Republican candidate, even if they are pro-Trump? That's a really good question. I think you've got to make it about Trump. If you can make it about you believe in this man, President Trump, he's going to give you a better life. The economy is getting better. And Joe uh, Manchin is an unreliable supporter. That's how you get a uh, Trump Democrat 
the vote against Manchin. Yeah, but that didn't work in Pennsylvania. Well, this is different. Yeah, he didn't win Pennsylvania by like 40 points. Uh -huh. So I think right now it's ours to win. Don't underestimate Joe Manchin. Don't nominate the guy that's been in jail recently, and you're probably in good shape. Is Joe nervous? <laughs> is, the, is Senator Manchin nervous about his seat? Oh, Have you talked to him? Well, if I lived in a state that Trump won by 40 points and I was a Democrat, I'd be nervous. He's one of my good friends, but, but this is politics. But give us some inside baseball here. I think he's going to work hard. Don't underestimate him. But the winds are blowing against Joe. Don't nominate the guy in jail, and we'll probably be okay. Is, he, is, he, is Manchin going to run as a Republican, though? Essentially, not, not that, switching parties, but ideologically. How does he appeal to a state and keep that? Safe? I think he has to answer uh, Katie's question. I will be there for Trump as much as I can. I'll say no sometimes, but mm -hmm. most time I'll be there with Trump. Unfortunately, uh, the Republican Party has an agenda that Joe yep. hasn't signed up for that Trump has. Yeah, All right, well, we will are getting see how it's convoluted. Plays yes. out. <laughs> this and a programming out. note, don't yeah. miss the West Virginia Senate debate. That is tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern time. It's going to be moderated by Brett Baer and Martha McCallum right here on Fox News. You'll get to know those candidates that we spoke about and uh, see the next hot contest that could be yet another bellwether. We've got more on the Outnumbered Couch in just a moment. Stay right here. Thank you so much to Senator Lindsey Graham. I hope you enjoyed your time on the couch. It was the best hour, and I will come back if you'll have wow. me. Wow. All That's right. Fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. And is it, uh, is it less stressful than running for president? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're surrounded by a lot nicer people. <laughs> That's Who asked good to harder know. questions, by the way. <laughs> and, the, and the couch is uh, surprisingly less crowded than the yeah, Republican field was very, in 2016. Very nice. There were 16 of us before. The debate was a little more civil as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. There, was, there weren't important. any nicknames mm -hmm. today. All right. Well, thing. thank you so much, Senator. And we are back on the couch at noon Eastern tomorrow.